Assalamu alaikum jamia and thank you the chairman. Uh, I would like to start to thanking uh, Al Faisal University, Dr. Jazia, for the nice invitations. I was asked to speak about the kidney and the bladder cancers. Now, in the GU cancer, if you can see the prostate cancers from 2005 to 2016, there is some medication was available, and every years we have medication followed by another medications. In the kidney cancer, the same story, and the bladder cancer from 1980 till 2016, we start to have the therapy. So definitely in 2006, the renal cyst carcinoma, there was no treatment at that time. And me and Mubarak and Amir Tijan, we were referring all the patients because we don't have any medication at that time. Subsequently, we have plenty of medications. So if you ask me as a medical oncologist, what is the most important disease that changing the paradigm of the treatment in the last two years, I will say renal cyst carcinoma, renal cyst carcinoma, adrenal cyst carcinoma. We don't have medications. It's for a long time. We have only one available medication with sinatinib, and currently we have plenty of medications. Now, if you see in the last years, there was a three important clinical trial, which all of them showed clearly of survival benefit. All of them, they, they published in New England Journal of Medicine. The first one, the Shikmate 214, everybody knows when they use the combination immunotherapy head-to-head -head with the sonatinib and the children overall survival benefit, and the keynote and jafalin, we are going to discuss it in detail. So the keynote trial, 426, was just published in 2019. Patient who is naive, renal cyst carcinoma, metastatic disease, with a miserable disease, they were randomized to bimbrolizumab plus exatinib, and head-to-head -head with the sonatinib. So they changed the combination from immunotherapy plus immunotherapy to immunotherapy plus KKI and to head with, uh, to the sonatinib, which is our standard of care. And the primary endpoint was progression over uh, progression free survival as well as the overall survival. Now, if you look for the overall survival, we reached to the hazard ratio of 53, and we did not have this result before, and with a very significant B value in favoring of the combination therapy. As you can see at 18 months. 82 still surviving of the patient with the combination therapy. The same story in the progression-free survival, which was actually at the hazard ratio of 0.69 with a very significant B value. And the objective response in the first line was almost approaching 60%, I mean 60% to comparing to the 30% with the using of sonatinib. And as you can see, the median duration of response does not reach with the combination therapy. What about the other trials, Jafalin? The same story, identical uh, key eligibility, treatment naive, advanced or metastatic clear cells, renal cells carcinoma. They were randomized to avilumab, which is, CT, which is again BDL1 inhibitors, checkpoint inhibitor, plus exatinib head to head with the standard of care of sonatinib. And in this trial, they were looking for progression-free survival as well as the overall survival in BDL1 tumors. And a matter of fact, you can see almost doubling between seven, seven months to 13.8, very significant B value and hazard ratio of 0.61. Now, when they look for the overall survival, it does not reach in both. However, this is immature and still we are waiting. I have no doubt in the next meeting, we will find a nice separation between the two arm. Now, if you look for the BDL1 positive and for those overall population, either positive or negative, it seems they drive both of them the same benefits. And as you can see it in terms of the progression free survival, as well as the objective response. So we have a four important clinical trial, the Shikmate immunotherapy plus immunotherapy, the keynote immunotherapy plus TKI, Jafalin TKI plus immunotherapy, and the motion trial when they use atezolizumab plus bevazumab, and forget about it because it was negative trial. And if you can see the response rate, we are reaching almost up to 50 to 60%, and we did not have this before. And the most important thing, look for the complete response with immunotherapy that we reached to almost 10%, and the same story with other immunotherapy of 5 to 
So uh, we have huge success in over all the three important clinical trials, changing practice. So me, Mbarak, Dr. Amin Tijani, what's the best option to choose? Which one we should choose among all of these three? Now, the relevant factor, number one, we should look for the risk categories. And we believe, if you can see now, I think my part is very clear. If you look for the four and four and four, all the four clinical trials, it's a 57, uh, the hazard ratio. Now, if you go for the intermediate, it's 66. If you go for the favorable, it's going more. So it seems that the combinations of immunotherapy with uh, we, uh, it's not, does, does not help in patient with favorable risk, and this clearly shown in the emotion 150 when they look for gene signatures, and when they look for the angiogenesis in favorable risk, it's angiogenesis derivative. Why in, in poor and intermediate, it's T lymphocyte. This is the reason why the combinations of immunotherapy and immunotherapy does not play a major role in favorable and compared to the TKI. Number two, what about the sarcomatoid features? We know clearly it's carry a poor prognosis and usually diagnosed late and very aggressive. And there is no effective treatment. We are usually, I mean, used for years and years, chemotherapy, sonatinib, and we have very bad results. And when they look for the efficacy of the trial, the subsequent analysis from the whole trials, you can see now with the adding immunotherapy, you can see at 20 years, 73% they still survive. And the complete remissions in the immunotherapy, immunotherapy plus immunotherapy, we reach to 18%. Remember the initial trial for the whole population was only 10%. So we are speaking about one fifth of a very aggressive type of tumor, they have complete response with sarcomatoid features. So number two, what about the non-clear cells type? We have a lot of non-clear cells, papillary like or homophobic types, and clearly we have two important trials, and it showed clearly that immunotherapy may play a role in those category of patients. However, this is only phase two trials. As you can see here, for, for bimbrolizumab, you can see the overall response reached almost 25% in the papillary types and reached to almost 34 in unclassified type. We did not achieve this result before the era of the immunotherapy. So the big question we always ask ourselves is the immunotherapy plus immunotherapy or immunotherapy plus TKI. Unfortunately, we don't have clinical trial compared between the two, but this is a retrospective analysis and it showed clearly whatever you're going to start, either with this regimen or this regimen, there is no huge difference of 188 patients. As we say, this is a retrospective analysis. So for renal cell carcinoma with good risk, bimbrolizumab plus exatinib, or avilumab plus exatinib is the standard of care, while in the intermediate plus poor risk, immunotherapy plus immunotherapy, or again, immunotherapy plus TKI is an option, valid option for the therapy. So again, let's go for the most difficult part, which is the bladder cancers. From 1980, uh, at that times, we don't have only cisplatinum. Any patient who will come from the door, we'll give him cisplatinum, and we did not have any achievement since that time until 2016, when we start to know about the immunotherapy, and we have the atezolizumab at that time, and subsequently we have cascade of therapy. And if you look for the survival in from 1990 till 2000, compared to 2001 until 2010, it's identical. There is no change by any means. Those who was treated in 90, it's the same until 2010, the same survival benefit. There was no improvement. You can see it's completely identical uh, line and hardly you can see the separations. So it's mean we are dealing with a very aggressive, with a very poor outcome. So when we divide the patient of bladder cancer to fit and unfit patient, and clearly for the fit patient, we use a very important for their trial. When they look for gym cisplatinum chemotherapy with MVAT, and the matter of fact, Gym platinum, it's become the standard of care. As you can see, this is, was published in GCO in 2000. And since that time, this is the standard of care for cisplatinum eligible. There was no difference between the MVAC and gym cytomene cisplatinum, and it was less toxic. So any patient who will come at that time 
will give them gem cis platinum as a first line in patients who is cis platinum eligible. Now, lately we have five new medications that approved in those category of patients, pimprolizumab, atezolizumab, nifolumab, and afilumab, and dorofilumab. And out of this, five of them, they used in second line, those who is refractory to the cis platinum. I'm not going to discuss it because there was nothing in this year, it was last year. But if you can see the atezolizumab and vimprolizumab, the only positive trial in terms of the overall survival was vimprolizumab. Atezolizumab, there was no difference between the atezolizumab and chemotherapy in second line setting. And in spite of this, it's still in the NCC guideline because they claim atezolizumab is less toxic. It's a very expensive, but less toxic compared to the chemotherapy. Nivolumab, avilumab, and dorfolumab, all of them were approved based on phase two trial. I cannot believe the NCC guideline, they put avilumab as a 1B. This is a phase 1B. And in spite of this, they consider as an option in patients with metastatic uh, transitional cell carcinoma. So what about those who was platinum ineligible, those who has uh, heart disease, those who has peripheral neuropathy, those who has renal impairments? We have two important medications, a bimprolizumab plus atezolizumab, and clearly both of them, it showed better survival benefit, and this has become the standard of care. So patient with cis platinum eligible, the first line was gym cis platinum chemotherapy, and those with cis platinum ineligible, usually with a go with the atezolizumab plus bimbrolizumab as a first option. So what's happened in the last uh, two, in the last years? They tried to bring the atezolizumab, as we said, it's in the second line. They were trying to bring atezolizumab plus gym cis platinum chemotherapy in the first line setting. So basically, transition cis carcinoma, they were randomized to three important arm. The first arm, atezolizumab plus chemotherapy, or atezolizumab as alone, or chemotherapy that we use. And a matter of fact, the trial was completely negative, and there was no benefit from adding atezolizumab in the first line. So till today, at uh, 2 o'clock, any patient who will come to you pro, uh, with transition cis carcinoma, the line of therapy should be gym cis platinum in spite of the old trial trying to change this. And again, the overall survival the same. The only benefit was with uh, the response rate of 47 with a combination treatment. So what about if they add, again, fast growth and ethereal growth factor? They try to cis platinum plus gym cytopene, and they add bevazumab to the arm, and to head to head with gym cytopene cis platinum alone. It was phase three, phase three trial, very clear key eligibility, first line of therapy, and the matter of fact was completely negative. So again, in the first line, still, till today, gym cytopene cis platinum is the standard of care, in spite of the two important medication, showed clear evidence in, in, in phase two trial, tend to be negative in phase three trial, so no role of atezolizumab at the meantime, no role of bevazumab in first line therapy. Again, if you see the progression-free survival, it gives us one month median difference uh, with the clinical significance. <clears throat> what about a very important, now we are in the era of personalized medicines. And clearly, in the, one of the important uh, mutation is a fast uh, fibroblast growth factors. And we know clearly when fibroblast growth factor is increasing, this is will uh, promote the tumor genesis and promote the angiogenesis for cancer cells. So patients with metastatic, unresectable, local advanced urethral cancers, they in second line and third line of therapy, they were looking for those who has the mutations and they give radafetinib. And it was published in New England General Medicine. It's a phase two trial, and they were looking for the overall response rate. And believe or not, those patients who has this mutation, and we only give these medications, we reach to 40%. We never had 40% in a bladder cancer in second and third line, and hardly with the first line therapy. 40% of 99, they have response rate. And if you look for those who is a chemo naive, those who has progressed after BDL1 inhibitor, those who have physical metastasis, you can see they are still benefiting. And the most important, those who receive prior immunotherapy, we can see they benefit more. 
Don't ask me why. Nobody knows at the meantime. When they look for the overall survival in phase two trial, in second line therapy, we reached to almost 14 month overall survival. It's tremendous, it's huge. We never had this number before. In Adafitinib, it was FDA approved only just last week, and it's become one of the standard of care <coughs> based on phase two trial. And there is ongoing phase three trial, in Adafitinib alone, or Adafitinib plus immunotherapy. So what about the second important personalized medicine, which is the infertumab. Infertumab basically is anti nictin and clearly anti nictin 4 targeted therapy. If you block it, you are going to block the tumor genesis and angiogenesis and vascularization, vascularization of tumors. And basically, again, based on single arm phase 2 trial for those patients who has this type of uh, uh, those uh, type of disease as a second line therapy, they were started on infertility, which is an oral medication, and the primary endpoint was overall response rate. And uh, basically, if you see the response rate was 44%. So we have two important personalized medicine now in the bladder cancer. Not only the lung, we have now in the bladder cancers. We have two important now, infertumab as well as iradafetinib. And clearly, you can see the response rate is almost 44%. And if you see the progression-free survival and overall survival, we reached to almost 11 months, those as a second and third line of therapy. So I don't know why this is in the opposite, but I, sh I hope that you can read it. So there is no doubt, kidney and uh, bladder cancer is rapidly evolving. In 2019, we have two new approval regimens in the first line, uh, carcino renal carcinoma, avilumab plus bimbrolizumab, or bimbrolizumab uh, plus uh, bimbrolizumab therapy, regardless of the risk factor and regardless of uh, BDL status. And definitely, there is no new change in the second line therapy. So in 2019, the bladder cancer, again, there is no new change in the first line. Till today, end of the year of 2019, gemcitabine, cisplatinum, this is the regimen that used by Dr. Uh, Jazriya 30 years ago. So we are still using the same therapy. And uh, definitely uh, no new change in second line therapy. The only thing we have new to FDA approval, the first one for eradafetinib for those who has FDG rearrangement or mutations. And uh, the other one is Entropomab as a th second and third line, which huge small rate of 44%, huge survival benefit on those, it was noticed in those two medications, we reached to almost 12 and 14 uh, a month. Uh, I think uh, we are still lacking clearly more of predictive factors and we are going to see it, inshallah, hopefully within the uh, next coming two years. I think with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you so much.